So, I wonder if I can fill this script with really terrible jokes. Of course I can. <laughs> okay, new Vauxhall Corsa. Interesting little backstory, this one. So the story goes that Vauxhall had spent all the requisite years and millions of pounds developing a replacement for the last course and the fourth one. And the car had been signed off, right? It was good to go. And then in 2017, PSA came along, that's Peugeot Citroen, bought Vauxhall and was like, no. So it gave Vauxhall the chassis of the Peugeot 208, and a big box of parts and said, okay, do it again, use all this stuff. And you've only got two years to do it. So on the one hand, the Corsa here is the figurative Roman village built in a day, but on the other, the Romans were provided with prefabricated buildings and very clear instructions. But before we get into this short story, please hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, hit like or hit dislike if you want, it's a democracy. And if you're interested in a Vauxhall Corsa or any other small hatchback or anything really, please go to vanarama.com for some awesome lease deals. There are many. So, the Peugeot Citroen Vauxhall Corsa. It bodes well because the new Peugeot 208 is brilliant, apparently. I've not driven it yet. I will be soon though, so like I said, subscribe and that. I'll stop doing that now, sorry. But if it's anywhere near as good as it looks, or as good as the other recent Peugeots have been, then it will actually be difficult for Vauxhall to get this wrong. So, here's what it looks like driving a Corsa. I'm perfectly happy, see? Because the Corsa here is very good in many ways. It'll do a fine job of getting you from point A to point B. It has enough space, it's usually comfortable, it's very safe for a small hatchback, and if you get one from us, all this for a very affordable monthly lease price. So if you like the look of the Corsa, which you probably do because everybody seems to buy a Corsa, you can stop this review right here, get on with your life. Don't know, because I'm going to try and entertain you. But to go back to what I was saying before about this particular Corsa's gestation, there are a couple of areas of the car that in my view aren't quite up to scratch with the very best in the small hatchback genre. A genre that includes some absolutely brilliant stuff, like the dynamically sensational Ford Fiesta, and the big car quality Volkswagen Polo, and even the UK's cheapest new car, the Dacia Sandero, if you're into that sort of thing. So clap your eyes on it, and there is definite improvement. It's five door only for now, and it does look bigger on the road. Features like this shark fin C pillar, which Vauxhall is so proud of that it puts a little picture of a shark in the car itself to remind you that it's there. And the contrasting roof colours and some snazzy wheels, because kids like that sort of thing. And the pointy DRLs, it's all pretty neat. Basically, it looks more like a big car than a Corsa ever has, which I think is probably a deliberate ploy by Vauxhall to make it look less, I'm gonna put this, chavy. In the cabin, it's not quite as successful. IMO. Largely nice, but there is some obvious cost cutting and one or two poor design choices, I think. The infotainment system is lifted directly from Citroen. Citroen being a company whose infotainment systems are notoriously ropey. So that move was a little bit like Metallica asking Little Wayne to record a guitar solo for them. Do it now! <laughs> I mean, it's not terrible. The menus are generally clear and okay, but the screen is kind of slow to respond, you know? It just feels a bit sluggish. Although thankfully the volume and the temperature controls aren't built into the software. They've got little knobs of their own. And then there's like old Corsa switch gear for the lights here. And just the general flimsiness of the whole thing, the plastics. Listen. Drums, please. But the most egregious bit of design in this cabin is down here, the glove box. I haven't opened the doorway to so much disappointment since Christmas 1988. My brother got a Mega Drive, I got a telescope. Thanks a lot, Santa, you absolute. It's this massive undamped slab of plastic that when you open it, slams onto the knees of whoever's sitting in the passenger seat like a medieval drawbridge. <laughs> half full of circuit board, which is a thing that Citroen always does in its cars, and it's really vexing. And it's a similar sort of situation with the rest of the storage in the cabin. It's almost like an afterthought rather than being a priority. Like quite small door pockets, they're quite thin, and quite a little storage space in the center console. The boot is canny big, right, which is good, although it is literally just a felt-lined gap behind the seats. No hoops, 
no twin level floor. When you fold the seats, it's not a flat loading bay. But I accept that that might not bother you, right? Because you're just gonna chuck things into it. And in that respect, it works just fine. Same goes for the rear seat space, right? So if you got your tape measure out, you'd probably find that there isn't a class leading amount of knee space, but there is just about enough room back there for three averagely sized adults. And if you are an averagely sized adult, which statistically is probably the case, you'll find the driving position very comfortable indeed. And that's a very good thing about this Corsa. But if you happen to be a bit on the taller side, like I am, then it's probably worth mentioning that the pedals are just too close together, right? So quite often your feet will catch each other if you're on the brake and the clutch at the same time. And that's especially problematic if you wear super wide fashion trainers. That in particular is a Citroen trait, right? And it wouldn't ordinarily be a huge problem, but it is exacerbated by the particular engine and gearbox setup in this car. So for now, the Corsa comes with three internal combustion engines and one fully electric drivetrain. I will be reviewing the electric one separately very soon. So for this purpose, we'll ignore that completely. So this is the traditional engine range, let's call it. So as you can see, it's quite small, but there is a strong case for reducing it even further down to one, this one. It is brilliant, sounds great, feels punchy, in the right gear that is, which I'll come to, and it's economical. Obviously the diesel is even more so, but that only really makes sense if you're doing particularly high mileage. And while I personally think that the turbo petrol is the one to go for, because it gives you that bit extra oomph, the base model 1.2 petrol does give you a decent entry into the world of Corsa. I'm talking particularly if you're a driver of the less old persuasion. So it still sounds good because it's a three part. It's gonna be dead economical around the doors, cheap to insure, and here it comes, cheap to lease from us. Now the engines and the chassis in general have benefited a lot from Peugeot's involvement. This Corsa is bigger than the last one, but lighter model for model. So the three cylinder turbo engine, for example, uses a lot of aluminium. So that means it's relatively light. And in my opinion, it's the highlight of the whole car. It is pretty punchy when you've got it in the power band, but that is a thing because the power band is a pretty narrow space in the middle of the rev range. And the six speed gearbox has quite close ratios. And that's why you end up shuffling around it all the time. In purely mechanical terms, it's no problem because the Clutch is light and the gearbox is light. There isn't really any such thing as like a badly clunky gearbox anymore. So when you're doing 30, it's never quite sure whether it wants to be in third or fourth gear. So the indicator is always telling you to shift up and down between the two. So you end up doing the Oxbridge shuffle, like the boat race. So that with the clutch thing can be pretty irritating, especially if you are planning on driving this around town a lot, which you probably are because it's a Corsa. And that is why I would suggest getting this engine with an automatic gearbox, which of course completely eradicates this problem and removes one of the pedals, eradicating that problem too. Yes. At town speeds, general refinement is really good. Engine's really quiet, not much wind noise, not much mechanical noise, but it sort of comes undone gradually the quicker you go. That's when it starts to feel more like a small car. Ride quality around town's pretty good too, okay? But it's another area of this car whose facade is fine, but then when you dig a little deeper, it starts to come undone a bit. The best suspension setups, the most sophisticated ones, even in small cars like this, will mitigate the inconsistencies of the road, but they'll do that while keeping the body fairly level, fairly planted. This just feels soft, right, on a basic level. So at low speeds, it's comfortable. It's not gonna have your sovereigns rattling together. But what that means is that if the road's less than perfect, the body never quite settles down. It always feels like it's sort of bouncing slightly and trying to find its feet. And once you notice that, you can't unnotice it. So let's just hope that if you buy one of these, you don't notice it. And so you're probably thinking that this must be especially cheap, right? So it can look like a lot of money in the context of cars that do the same sort of thing, but often a lot better. However, this is very well equipped as standard and it's actually very reasonably priced to lease. And that's the way that you really need to view the Corsa, right? It's a spacious runabout that isn't gonna give you anything riveting, a particularly, a particularly? <laughs> But it will be a cracking five door runabout because it's well equipped as standard, it looks decent and it is a very cost effective lease. That alone makes it something to consider. But if you really want to drive the thing, you know, take it around your favourite back roads and all that sort of semi cliched stuff. In my view, this probably isn't the small hatchback that you're looking for. Because it's certainly not engaging to drive does sound mean though. So in making the suspension so soft and the steering so light, Vauxhall has removed a lot of the sense of small car fun. There's a feeling of detachment in the steering and the suspension really doesn't tell you very much about what's going on down there at all. The problem this has is that it gets more detached and more floaty the faster you go. Again, it's not bad, it's not problematic as such, but a Fiesta, 
or a Santa Bitha or a Mini would run rings at... <sighs> Thanks. <laughs> Stupid car bonging at us. Those cars have something more visceral about them than this. You can really lean on those things when you'd get them going around a corner. And you can with this a little bit, but sometimes, especially at higher speeds, it just feels a bit more like, you know, playing tag across a bouncy castle. It does grip like, and it sounds really good. He says, as he messes up a gear change. <laughs> Thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed this. Please leave a comment, let me know whether you agree or disagree with this. Please hit like, and again, go to Vanarama if you're interested in using one of these. See you soon, bye. Now playing Metal Radio. Hey Siri, be quiet.